Got your Bibles? Let's go to Romans chapter seven this morning. Uh, Romans uh, chapter number seven, and we're going to continue the series that we've been doing on here called uh, "Letter That uh, Changes Lives," or could even call it a letter that uh, changed the world. And uh, we've uh, learned a lot, and uh, we've seen things in here from uh, the Apostle Paul's writing that are very important to us. That that whether whether you're somebody seeking the Lord today or uh, you're somebody that's uh, come to Him in faith a long time ago, there are things from uh, the book of Romans that we need to be mindful of so that we experience revival. I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. And so that we can mature and uh, move forward. In Romans chapter 7, we're going to look at <clears throat> excuse me, verses 7 through 13. This morning I'm going to start in verse number 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known uh, lust except by the law had said, except the law, excuse me, said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of conspicuance. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. In the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and in the commandment holy, and just, and good. Now verse 13 is where we'll end. Was then that which is good... Made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So, the title of the message this morning is Sin Awareness. Sin Awareness. Uh, this is probably not the most popular sermon that I've ever preached at this church or even out of the book of Romans this morning. But it is a message that we need to hear, and it is a message we need to take uh, to heart, ladies and gentlemen, because without being sin aware in our lives, without being sensitive to, to what may possibly exist there, and uh, confessing that and turning from that, we won't experience revival. We won't experience growth. We will stagnate. Uh, we will grow discouraged. We will grow weary unless we have that sin awareness in our lives. Let's pray uh, one more time before we move on. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I pray that you would take this passage in Romans today and use it in our hearts and in our lives. And I pray, Lord, if someone's here and they don't know for sure that they're on their way to heaven, whether they're here in the audience or uh, they're watching the recording online later or listening to the recording later, that uh, you would use... Uh, this message to uh, <clears throat> excuse me, point them to you. Lord, I pray you uh, use me at this time. Help me to say what you want said. Keep me from saying anything that you don't want said this morning. And uh, uh, may, may we be encouraged and may we be strengthened not by my words or my thoughts or ideas, but by literally the, the very Word of God that we know doesn't return void. We know sharper than any two-edged sword and discerns hearts and discerns thoughts. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for our provision made through Jesus Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The process of sanctification, that is being set apart, can be compared to that of an iceberg. Uh, an iceberg is almost 90% underwater. Uh, if you go down to the, the Titanic Museum down in Branson, you will see they illustrate this point where you see the part above the water is, is much smaller than the part that is underneath the water. And in the same way, I believe sin is a, a similar uh, way in our lives. Uh, there may be little, little signs of it outwardly, but underneath is where there are far greater uh, destruction that goes on. So as the sun shines on the iceberg, the most exposed parts melt moving the lower part upward. In the same way, we are usually aware of only a small part of our sinfulness and our need. 
which is all we can deal with at one given time. However, as the light of God's work it comes into our lives and changes us in the areas that we know about and we become aware of the new areas needing the work of God. So before we look at our text any further, I hope that we would keep this in mind. And Let me remind you this morning that the greatest uh, news is simply summed up in this statement that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is the greatest news ever known. The whole human race, uh, because of sin, is bound for hell. Every man, every woman born into this world has hell for a destiny. It is not enough to be just sin aware this morning. We must be Savior sensitive. That is the cure as we're aware, being aware of our sins. You may say, well, I'm aware of my sins. And as we go through the text this morning, we're going to see how it's important to be aware of our sins. But in dealing with that, and as we're being aware of our sins this morning, I would strongly encourage you to be Savior sensitive as we're becoming sin aware and aware of our sin. And it's not being aware of our sin in the sense of continuing in it, because we know God forbid, right? And we've looked at the last couple of weeks, especially as you look at Romans 6, you, you see that, that, uh, that our lives are personified by kings. Grace and life is, is, is a personified by a king. We are either ruled, we are guided by grace this morning, or we are ruled or we are guided by death and, and, and the law and the, and the sin that's there. And by the way, the law by itself doesn't save us. The law by itself uh, is, is, is not what is going to help us. The law should, should produce within us this morning the uh, idea that we need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the law should, should awaken within us. Hey, I need to come to Jesus. Jesus is the answer. The law in and of itself is not the answer. For, for centuries upon centuries, during this time that this was written, and, and, and even since then, people have tried to live by their good standards that they put on themselves, or they try to look at the law, just look at just trying to keep it. The law is supposed to drive you and I to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. So we're going to look at three things this morning about sin awareness and about how the law plays a role there. Number one, we see in verse 7 the role of the law. We see the role of the law. Look at verse number 7 with me. <clears throat> Excuse me. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. When a law or a rule restricts an evil desire, the sinful tendency of mankind is to want to do that which is restricted even more until it is satisfied. You've heard me use the illustration about maybe you take a kid out of a finger painting class and you tell them, don't stick your hand on the wall. What? Forbidden fruit, right? You ever heard of that term, forbidden fruit? So the role of the law here, what does the law do? Well, it, the law educates. The law educates. Paul opens this, question, this section with a question. Is the law sin? Well, of course not. The law came from the Lord, therefore it cannot be evil. He gave the law to Moses, right? Uh, however, while the law is good, it is also vital to have a proper understanding of the nature of sin. If you go back to chapter 3 and verse 20 here in Romans, he says here, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. And I'm going to stop right there and say, the, the idea there of keeping the law, it's not enough. It's not enough. But he doesn't just say there, he says, for the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul makes it very clear when we went through Romans 3 quite a while back, it feels like forever ago now, but when we went through Romans 3 a while back, we, we looked at the fact that the law is supposed to point us to Jesus Christ. It is supposed to drive us to the one that has the answer. It's not meant for us to sit there and just try to do better. We're not, that would be the dynamic equivalent of a football team that's down 50 to nothing at halftime, and they go into the locker room, and the coach just says, guys, just play better. Just play better. We're not going to change our game plan. We're not going to substitute players. Just go out there and play better. That's what keeping the law essentially is. 
And you know what the definition of insanity is, right? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Paul reveals to us the, tr- the, uh, the truth that it was the holy law of God that taught him to come to know about sin. He mentions the sin of lust and tells us that had the law not said, thou shalt not covet, he wouldn't have known what lust is. We need the law, ladies and gentlemen, to, to reveal sin to us. But the law in itself is not the answer. I know I'm repeating myself, but it, it needs to be repeated. Because if we're not careful, we just look at the law, and we study the law, and we try to live by the law without an ounce of anointing from the Holy Spirit and without an ounce of depending on the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to have a Christ-centered life. We have got to have Savior-sensitive uh, approach to Christianity. Because it is Christianity, right? It's not, it's not law entity. It's not, uh, you know, travis entity. I can pick on Travis because he's been here a couple times now. That was a joke. But uh, uh, my point is, is that we can't make it about ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. It's got to be about Christ. And it's, it is so simple that we just might miss it if we don't keep hammering away at it. There's a list I look at all the time. It's got verses on it. probably look at it every day along with my devotional reading. Who am I in Christ? Who am I in Christ? You should know who you are in Christ. That you're a conqueror in Christ. That you're loved through Jesus Christ. And the list goes on and on. Before Paul knew the law, he had no inner struggles with sin. But when he was confronted with the law, it named specifically what he was involved in. The law began its attack on Paul's sinful life. And ladies and gentlemen, the law as it exists now begins an attack on our sinful life. That's why the answer is not in the law. That's why you have to go to Jesus. The one who fulfilled the law. The one who is greater than the law. He isn't blaming his sin on the law. Paul is merely pointing out for us the truth that the law made plain exactly what sin really was. The law identifies sin. Your car can have a check engine light on, and you've got some options. You can do what a girl in my high school did, put a piece of electrical tape on that, and just keep driving. That didn't get her very far. Her car blew up on her eventually. Or you can go to O'Reilly's, and they have a little device that they hook up, and they see what that code is that that thing's throwing, because when that check engine light comes on, it throws a code. But you can't see it on your own, right? You can't say, well, I know what that check engine light is. No, you've got to have a code reader to know exactly what it is. You may have an idea, but without that code reader that's able to look in the depths of that computer in your car to identify what's going on there, you don't have a clue. And the law is like that code reader. The law shines a light, and if you're like me, you don't like a light shined on you. I don't know about you all. I don't, I don't want my thoughts and and emotions, a light being shined on that. But the law does that. And it's not designed to make you feel, well, I'm lower than a worm. That's not what it's there. It's there so that you point, see that it's sin, and then you take that to the Lord. You go to Him in prayer. You confess. You repent. You ask Him to change the desires of your heart. That verse in Psalms, He'll give you the desires of your heart. That's not saying, well, if I have a desire for a Ferrari, He'll just make it happen. I want a new truck. Who in here wants a new truck? I want a new truck. But that's not a a desire that the Lord's just going to make happen. But when we go to Him and we're Savior sensitive, He puts within us the right desires. I need to have the right desires. If I'm going to have revival, I've got to have the right kind of desires. If I'm going to serve here as pastor, I've got to have the right kind of desires. The law reveals what is beneath. Essentially, Paul's argument was that the law is not simply, uh, was not sinful simply because it makes us aware of what is sinful. The law is similar to an x-ray machine that reveals a tumor. The machine itself is not bad. It reveals something that is bad within us. We need the law to identify sin. 
Not to shame us completely, but to show us where we are in our spiritual maturity. The law, in other words, sets a speed limit so that we know exactly if we're going too fast. We might never know that we are sinning in many areas such as covetousness if the law did not spell this out specifically for us. So ladies and gentlemen, as you're reading through Exodus and Leviticus at the beginning of the year, if you're reading through your Bible, or when we did our Christ uh, Revealed in the Old Testament, which I'm doing now on Sunday nights via live stream, when we see the law there, it's real easy to say, eh, and go right on past it. Because there's not this exciting narrative that's there in the law like there is in Genesis, right? Like there is in the beginning of Exodus where you see Pharaoh and, and Pharaoh's uh, uh, got the people under his grips and you see the tyranny of Pharaoh and then Moses comes up and it's exciting to read all that about that and you read about these plagues and you wonder how do these people deal with life? How do they deal with frogs? And you read that and it's almost comical to some degree. But then when we get to the law, it's like, uh, snoozeville, we'll move on. Those are things we still need to read, ladies and gentlemen, and give attention to and understand that the blood of Christ covers where we fall short there. That Jesus Christ died so that you weren't bound to that anymore. So that the penalty of that law is no longer laid to your account. Secondly, we see the ruining of the law. We see the ruining of the law. Look at verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of conspicuous conspicuance, excuse me, <clears throat> for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Verse 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. It isn't the fault of the commandment, but it is our fault. That's why there's a ruining here. We need to look at a couple of things about what the law says that's about us that's ruined. We need to understand, according to one Bible scholar, the word occasion. That word occasion is in the original uh, Greek, a, a military term that refers to a base of operations. Prohibition furnishes a springboard from which sin is all too ready to take off, according to Mr. Harrison. Occasion. So when we see that word occasion, or there's, there's this base of operations. We're using this military term, which, which is fitting because Paul talks about spiritual warfare, right? Sin, it can take something that is good and holy, like the law, and twist it to promote evil. Sin warps love. Something as simple as love. Listen to me very carefully. Something as simple as love, the law can twist and, and warp it into lust. An honest desire to provide can be taken and turned into greed, and the law into a promoter of sin. James chapter 1, 14 and 15 tells us, But every man is tempted. Sorry folks, we're all tempted. It says it right here. When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust hath conceived, so when lust has this process going on, it comes forth as sin. And sin, when it is unfinished, bringeth forth death. You may say, well, I've sinned and I'm not dead. It's not always what that's about, ladies and gentlemen. It's not always about the things we see around us, Sure, there are certain types of sin. If you give yourself over to, there's likely death involved. But there's another death that's even more devastating than your vitals functioning. That is separation from God. And when you're separated from God, there's no. This, it's not a video game. You can't hit reset and say, well, Lord... I messed up in this life, so let me do it over again and I'll live for you. It doesn't work that way, ladies and gentlemen. You have an opportunity now to turn to Him. We have time now. It's, it's not later. If we, don't, if we aren't listening now, there's no guarantee of later. I believe we're in the last days of the last days, maybe even the last minutes of when I believe the Lord's going to uh, receive 
his people up into the clouds. And there's going to be a time of judgment here that I don't think anybody wants to be around for. I don't want to be here for it. That's why I'm trying to preach every sermon like it might be my last. The idea of separation from God, it may not seem like it today because we're so self-dependent, but it's a devastating and a scary thought to be separated from God. What does it mean to be separated from God? It doesn't reach out and bless you anymore. You don't have a relationship with Him. You no longer have access to go to Him. Right now, you have, you have access to go to Him. Here in a few minutes, we'll have an invitation time. That's a time you can do business with God. But when when you're spiritually dead and separated from Him, it's over. You may even sit here spiritually dead now, but it's not too late for you is the difference. You can come to Him. He wants you to come to Him. He's got His arms wide open for you uh, this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe you've drifted from Him. Maybe you've backslidden. It's not too late for you. The law promised something that it could not fulfill. Not because it was sinful, but because humanity is weak and rebellious. So the law basically became a death sentence. You know, I got saved at eight years old, but before that, I was nothing but a dysfunctional child of wrath. No different, on no different path than somebody who got saved in prison yesterday. I deserved the same hell they did. I was heading down the same road. I just didn't have drugs and and alcohol in my life. But I was still a dysfunctional child of wrath. I still thought I was good enough at eight years old. And then it dawned on me. Boy, if I died tonight, I'd split hell wide open. Uh, My good deeds at eight years old, it's not enough. And, and And I started naming sins in my life that I knew I'd committed at eight years old. I just knew it wasn't good enough. I knew I'd lied. I knew I'd stolen. The Bible says that if you're guilty in one offense, might as well be guilty of all of them. So verse 11. Paul uses this word deceive now. So we're moving on from the word occasion now. And now we look at the word in verse 11. Or excuse me, it's the same word, excuse me. The word deceived. We're looking at the word deceived. I got mixed up. We were looking at occasion. Now we're looking at deceived. So he said by sin, taking occasion by the commandment, verse 11, that base of operation. Now we see him talking about being deceived. That has the idea of being swindled. The word carries the idea of being cheated, tricked. The sins of Paul's life before coming to the Lord Jesus Christ had deceived him into thinking that he was pleasing God. There are a whole lot of people today that think they're pleasing God. And you know what? Jesus Christ is not in the equation. That's not my opinion. Well, Brother Josh, that's just just a hard... You're just too hard. You're just too mean. That's what God's Word says. If I didn't care about the Gospel and I didn't care about your eternity this morning, I wouldn't tell you that you've got to come to Jesus. Jesus Himself said, No man cometh unto the Father by what? Good works? No. By church attendance? No. By thinking good thoughts, doing good deeds? No, but by Jesus Christ. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me, Jesus said. There's only one way. There's not several ways. There's not a way that just, well, feels good. It's not about what feels good. It's about what the truth is. We've got to be committed to the truth. We live in a, in a culture that increasingly, increasingly is telling us what truth is subjective. Well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is truth is whatever I say it is. According to culture, not not that I'm saying that. Don't misunderstand me. But as as you talk to people, truth is relative. I had one person tell me that one time. Truth is relative. And there are no absolutes. Really? That's not what my Bible says. I've got to go with what I can have a firm foundation on. If, if, if it's all about emotions, my emotions are different every day. Maybe nobody has that problem. I don't always feel like going to work every day. I don't feel like going to work every day, so there's a truth there. I don't have to go to work because I don't feel like it. 
See where, see where you end up? It's everything is just what you say it is, and you have no final authority in your life if truth is subjective. It is clear that before Paul became a follower of Christ, Paul wanted to keep the law of God. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, if you want to turn there, he is absolutely clear about his passion to keep it. I'm going to read verses 8 through 11 in a moment, give you a chance to turn there if you'd like. Because I want you to see this and see... That Paul, the Apostle Paul had an amazing testimony. He had an amazing life. Uh, one that we can uh, look to for encouragement and, and model ourselves after. Uh, verse 8, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's not my best life now? No. He said he lost some things. Oh, it's just no fun. That's not what Paul's attitude was. Listen to what he says. And do count them but dung. (laughs) Garbage. Waste. The things he lost. He's saying to us, ladies and gentlemen, they weren't really a loss to him. Because listen to what he says. That I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Paul lived a Christ, a cross-centered life, if you will. As we see here in Philippians 3, and then back here in Romans 7, he echoes this. It's all about, he denied himself. If we're going to experience revival, Josh Hall's got to deny himself. I'm not looking or pointing a finger at anyone else in this room today. I've got to deny myself. I've got to be willing to lay my pride down, ladies and gentlemen. I've got to be willing to uh, allow the Lord to humble me. Because I can't, I can't get into your business. I can't, I can't work on your heart. I can proclaim the Word of God. That's what I'm trying to do this morning. But ultimately, I can't change you. And, and if I do change you, that's man-made manipulation. The law cannot give life. It can only show the sinner that he is guilty and condemned. This explains why legalistic Christians and churches do not grow and do not bear spiritual fruit. They are living by the law, and the law always kills. Few things are more dead than an orthodox church that is proud of its high standards, according to Warren Worsby, and tries to live up to them in their own energy. Warren Worsby goes on to also tell us that often members of such a church start to judge and condemn one another. And that is the sad result, and the sad result, excuse me, of this is a church fight and then a church split that leaves members or former members, according to Warren Worsby, angry and bitter. He knew what he was talking about. And we'll move on to the third and last thing of the revelation about the law. Revelation about the law. Look at verses 12 and 13 with me, we're almost done. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1, 8, 9 about the usage of the law. He says, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And he goes on to say how that's to be used, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. If you think you're a good person, you're not going to see a need for the law. But he says here, but for the lawless and disobedient and ungodly and for sinners, and for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. It's not for a righteous man. That is not made... For those who observe it, according to Matthew Henry, for if we could keep the law, righteousness would be by the law, but it is made for wicked persons to restrain them, to check them, according to Matthew Henry, and put a stop to vice and profaneness. So when we become sin aware, 
Love needs to reign in our hearts. It's all about love for Jesus, not rules. The problem with the law is us. The problem with the law as I read it today is Josh Hall. It's not anybody else. As we look at the law, we naturally want to try harder. God wants us to look at the law and turn to Jesus. There's nothing wrong with the law. It served its divine purpose in revealing God's holiness, revealing man's sinfulness, revealing man's need for God's grace, which came only through Jesus Christ. Paul said that the law is holy, righteous, and good. Paul's conclusion is that the law is holy and just. And if there was a problem, ladies and gentlemen, the problem was with the offender, not the law. It is clear that sin is so deceptive that it can take the law, something which was given as an instrument of life, and turn it into an instrument of death. The Bible is clear that the law was given to us to point us to Jesus Christ. Galatians 3 verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. And when I read that term schoolmaster, I think of that old black and white movie with Roddy McDowell, How Green Was My Valley. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it. This guy's got this real long ruler and he's a harsh schoolmaster. Not Roddy McDowell. Roddy McDowell's a little kid in that movie. But he's got this schoolmaster named Mr. Jonas. And Mr. Jonas was a real harsh teacher. He He's about that big around and about this tall. And, and he'd sit behind that desk and he'd lecture. And, he, and Roddy McDowell comes in one day and his boots are muddy. And he says, look at you, your boots are muddy. He goes, they were clean when I left home. And then he takes that ruler and he just wham, just, just wails on him with that ruler. That's what I think of when I see this word schoolmaster in Scripture. I think of a, of a man that's so harsh on, on things. The law is harsh. To bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Just as if you never sinned. But that doesn't come from your good deeds. It doesn't come from even good thoughts. It only comes by your faith being placed in Jesus Christ and you put on His righteousness. You know that you don't deserve heaven. And and, and you know that you can't get there. But Jesus paid that penalty for you. Jesus took your place. The law alone can never save the soul. It was never meant to, but it can point us to the one who can. It cannot get the task done, but it can make us so miserable and uncomfortable in our present condition that we want to find something better. So when when you read Scripture and, and, and you get convicted, turn to Jesus. It's not about, well, I need to do better. It's really about turning to Jesus because without Him, you're not going to do better. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. There are some in our day that do not like the Bible to be preached in its entirety. That's why I do expository preaching. They are opposed to preachers naming sins, declaring God's standards, and friends, there's nothing wrong with our Bible. It needs to be preached. James 1, 13 through 15, I'm almost done. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted. He is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. He provides that way to escape. Remember what it was? I've talked about it the last couple weeks. It's right here. This is our way to escape. It's right here. It's, it's, it's right there. That's, that's our way out. We've got to get in it. And we've got to let it get in us. It's easier now than ever to get in the Word of God. Everybody's got one of these. Some people have got multiple Bibles, multiple Bible versions on it. That's great. If, if, if this helps you, that's awesome. I'm proud of you. But take it a step further. Let the Word of God get into you. Let it interfere with your life. In closing... There was a duck hunter who was with a friend in the wide open land of southeastern Georgia. Far away on the horizon, he noticed there's a smoke cloud, or cloud of smoke, excuse me. Soon he could hear crackling as the wind shifted. He realized a terrible truth. A brush fire was advancing and heading towards him, so he could not outrun it. He goes through his pockets, and soon he finds a book of matches. As soon as he finds it, he lights a small fire around him and his buddy, Soon they're standing in a circle of blackened earth waiting for the fire to come. They didn't have to wait long. They covered their mouths with handkerchiefs 
and braced themselves. The fire came near them and even swept over them, but they were completely unhurt and untouched. The fire would not pass where fire had already touched. The law is like a brush fire. It cannot be escaped. But if we stand in a burn-covered place, not a hair of our head will be singed. Christ's death disarmed the law. That's what we need to remember today. As we're sin aware, as we're allowing God to work on our lives, it's about going to the Savior and being Savior sensitive. Let's pray.